Welcome, welcome, welcome to a very special chapel service today. We are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the creation of the Campus Christian Center. It's also the 38th year of our Tuesday chapel services. Many things to celebrate today. And whether you've been joining us for chapel for 38 years or it's your first time here with us, we sincerely hope you feel welcome at home, a part of this beautiful, rich faith community at Berea College. And to com commemorate the occasion, 50 years of the Campus Christian Center, we have a special gift for you to uh, remember this moment. We hope these commemorative prayer books enrich your spiritual life and serve as a reminder of the beautiful faith community here at the college. And we have a fantastic service for us today to celebrate our 50th. But before we hear those stories and remarks on the CCC's past, present, and maybe a little bit about our future, let us center our hearts and minds for our opening prayer. Let us pray together. Holy One, who has given us the breath of life, today we remember to breathe deeply, to rest, to take in, to pause before we act, and then to take another deep breath poised on the edge and risk jumping in, risk taking action, risk speaking up, risk using the gifts we have been given so that at the end of our time here at Berea, we can say with absolute clarity that no part of our existence was wasted in fear of failure or fear of success. Hold us. Prepare us the way to begin to offer the gift of your awakened presence, full of love and light today. These and the prayers of our hearts we lift up now in silence. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. Great are the works of the Lord. Full of honor and majesty is God's work. God's righteousness endures forever. The Lord is gracious and merciful. Holy and awesome is God's name. We praise you with all that we are. We trust you for all that we hope to be. Amen. This is a reading from the book of Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 to 31, from the New Revised Standard Version. And it reads, One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all of your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. This is the word of the Lord.
I want to uh, just welcome you all to this 50 year anniversary celebration and special welcome to a couple of our guests. Melissa Osborne is here and uh, Randy, her husband, Randy Osborne. <laughs> played such a key and extended role in not only directing the CCC but also the spiritual life of this college. So. Uh, we miss Randy terribly, Melissa, we know you do too. And also Lee Morris, uh, a, uh, a former uh, leader of this space as well. And welcome to you, Lee, we're glad to have you here. I was inspired when I saw on the program that we were going to hear one of my favorite songs, Oh God, Our Help in Ages Past. And, uh, it uh, is, of course, a, uh, an arrangement of one of the Psalms, Psalm 90. And so I made sure that uh, all of you would have a copy of both the full text of O oh God, Our Help in Ages Past and the King James Version of Psalm 90, because I was going to pick up on a little bit of that in my, uh, in my remarks. That song is very much a part of the Protestant religious tradition in which I was raised, and it's always been one of my favorites. It was written by a songwriter by the name of Isaac Watts over 300 years ago. Watts was a very prolific writer of Christian hymns and psalms, some 750 of them, uh, which we still can find in print, are credited to him, and you'll have heard of some of them. He uh, wrote Joy to the World, and when I survey the wondrous cross, among many others. The, the psalm on which it is based is actually attributed to Moses, unlike many psalms which are attributed to David. So the vaulting theme of that psalm and that song, time immemorial, goes back to about 1,300 years before the start of the Christian era. So about 3,300 3, years ago. Time is an interesting thing. We are always stuck stubbornly in the present moment. But time connects us to the past and the future. This was already on Moses' mind 3,300 3, years ago when he wrote his first line. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. And Isaac Watts in the, in the song connects ages past to the future in his second line, our hope for years to come. Similarly, this center has been a vibrant part of Berea College for 50 years. And because of its key role in meeting the great commitments, we can expect that to continue into the future it will be our hope for years to come. Likewise, this space we are in connects us to the past and the future. The Danforth family, in providing the funding for building this chapel, and it was completed according to our bulletin in 1937, also provided stones from antiquity, and those stones are built into the exterior north wall of this building. If you haven't looked at them carefully, I urge you to do so, as the family was thinking of this chapel, not only serving Berea in generations to come, but connecting to uh, beautiful uh, artifacts from the past. There's another striking couplet in the song. In verse 4, Watts says, A thousand ages in thy sight are like an evening gone. Moses puts it in his verse 4, for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past. Both pick up the idea that time is not the same for God as it is for us. For us, time creeps along a little slower when we're listening to a chapel meditation and a little faster when we're working on a timed exam but that's nothing 
like God's experience of time. God is everywhere and every when at once. Future and past are all the same time to God. The Psalms that are the basis of our responsive reading, and thanks so much, Sabrina, for leading us, connects to this thought too, as they celebrate the steadfast love of the Lord, which never changes. There could be another whole chapel meditation on the connection of love and time in God and in human affairs. But I'll leave that one for another speaker because I want to talk some more about Psalm 90. Here's something striking about that to me. Many of you know that before I became a college president, I was a physicist, and in some ways, I still think like one. Physicists have long pondered time, going back to another Isaac, Isaac Newton, and thanks to Einstein and some other important thinkers, including Stephen Hawking's, we have a, a way of thinking about time that works. That way of thinking is strikingly like the way the ancients saw God as understanding time, standing outside of it. Isaac Newton lived in the century before Isaac Watts. His definition of time, this is translated from the Latin, all of his writing was in the Latin, absolute, true, and mathematical time of itself and from its own nature flows equably without regard to anything external, and by another name is called duration. So although Newton was devout and a very well-informed Christian, he did not seem to incorporate the insights of Moses earlier and Isaac Watts later that it might be possible to step outside of time, as is God's nature, and was as, as imagined by later physicists who now look uh, from outside of time and see it as flowing along for certain, but originating together with space itself in an origin event, an origin event called the Big Bang. So what I'm saying is that the modern view of time, as I learned it as a student of physics, much more resembles the way Moses and Isaac Watts thought about time than, uh, than my own hero, Isaac Newton, thought about it. But this is not a physics lecture. This is an anniversary celebration of the Campus Christian Center. Yet here you hear me mixing physics into a meditation. And that's the last point I want to offer for your consideration. And I can get to that point by asking how is our CCC different from a church or a synagogue or a mosque or a temple or a Wiccan's midnight hilltop? Yes, like those other places, religious observances happen here and the spiritual quest we are all on is furthered. But here also happens deep integration of faith and other forms of learning and knowledge. That's the real point of our third great commitment, and that's what distinguishes the Campus Christian Center from a normal place of worship, the incorporation of spirituality into a learning community. And that's the final reason I would offer you why we can expect the CCC to be an integral part of Berea in the years to come. It will continue to contribute to the rich connections between learning and spirituality. So thank you for your attention, and time can now resume its normal, slightly quicker pace. With much gratitude, we recognize that we stand on the shoulders of many saints. We are here today to honor their lives and the work that they did here. The Campus Christian Center is planted on a firm foundation due to the foresight, commitment, and hard work of those who came before us. In the early 1980s, Lee Morris conducted oral interviews with people connected with religious life on campus. Lee, thank you for doing that. Thank you for having the foresight to do that. And thank you to Harry Rice for letting me know that these conversations existed in our archives. 
In preparation for this day, I read through all those transcripts and decided that the best way to share bits of our history is to use their words. Going all the way back to the 1930s, Gordon Ross was a religion professor. And in his 1983 conversation with Lee, he said this, there was a sentiment on the part of the administration against the idea of chaplain or campus minister or counselor, which I thought was a mistake. The idea of a counselor was supposedly taken care of by the notion, which seemed naive to me, that every teacher on this campus ought to be a counselor. Interesting. That sentiment continued with President Francis Hutchins. He said, I had the idea that I did not want a chaplain, but I did have to have some help. So I hatched out an idea of a coordinator of religious activities. Now, that went on for a while, and thankfully, with President Weatherford, the idea that every professor should provide ministry and counseling changed. And I'm guessing that many professors were pretty happy about that. Weatherford said, in regard to the structure of worship, I felt that the idea of a coordinator of religious activities was really insufficient. I felt the college should have a campus minister or a campus ministry named by the college, paid by the college, and be more active in working among students and faculty. We ought to be challenging our students to have a wider Christian experience. They've got to have their religious ideas challenged just like they have other ideas challenged. But if we challenge those ideas, we've got to support them emotionally as well as intellectually." End quote. Randy Osborne arrived in 1965 and in 1968 was asked to take on the responsibility of coordinator of religious activities continuing the task of the, making the arrangements for weekly Sunday night chapel services. Students, did you hear that? Weekly Sunday night chapel services, which were required, and they were presided over every Sunday night by the president. <laughs> In addition to this job, uh, Randy also taught as many as four sections of Old Testament each semester. It's a lot of work. Melissa, we are so delighted that you are here with us today and we're uh, remembering Randy with much, much fondness. In an, interview with, with, in an interview, Randy said, one of the first things I noticed in the fall of 68 as I looked over everything that was available to me to look over was that there was no budget and there was no money. <laughs> Right. There was money, no money to do anything but the Sunday night chapels. So I went to the president, explained to him the dilemma, and he said, we'll construct a budget that is based on the things that you think are important to do. So I did and submitted it to him. The money for the budget was granted without any serious question. One major result of having a budget for programming was the creation of the student organization, People Who Care, which was the first service organization on campus. Uh, it started in the spring of 1969, and it still exists today. President Weatherford and Randy Osborne had a vision, a dream, and they worked to see it come to life. Randy conducted surveys of the religious programming needs on campus and in 1971 wrote a proposal for a grant. Randy would tell the story of how President Weatherford, uh, he took the proposal to Mr. Eli Lilly and Mr. Lilly took notes on the back of a number 10 envelope. And after about an hour, Mr. Lilly called his wife in. And then about 30 minutes after that, they had agreed that the pro proposal was an exciting idea and that they would support it. And voila, the Campus Christian Center was born. The proposed budget would support two campus ministers, an administrative assistant, and a visiting Lilly Scholar. 
The first two campus ministers were Randy Osborne and Henry Parker. Henry was an Episcopal priest and the first African-American campus minister. Henry worked tirelessly with students, faculty, and staff to improve race, race relations and promote equality on campus as well as in the local community. In a sermon, Henry gave this advice to students, and the advice seems timeless, and I quote, you are here to be agents of change. You are in training to leave this place and help some of the problems that beset this community and this nation. Move into the community and across this nation and make this land one of unity and one where all humankind is committed to loving each other." End quote. Lee Morris joined the center in 1979. And Lee, we are so glad to have you here today as well. During his service, Lee worked with the Residence Life Leaders to create a position where students would provide voluntary service of support and encouragement in the residence halls. Through his commitment and expertise in pastoral care, the dorm chaplain program developed and soon became a secondary labor position under his supervision. Shortly after Lee retired, Lee wrote a comprehensive book about this beautiful chapel. If you haven't seen it, you should check it out. Nancy Holloway joined the team in 1986. Nancy currently lives in Lexington. She sends her greetings and a few memories of her time here. She says, Berea College had no woman in their campus ministry program. I decided to apply to be their first. I approached John Stevenson, the president of the college at the time. He approved me for a one-third position to determine whether this would work. Yeah, women weren't doing that then. <laughs> uh, with his approval, I became the first woman campus minister. Nancy also initiated providing a, a meal after the noon chapel service on Tuesday. So we can all be thankful to Nancy for that. Now, I don't know what it is about hiring female chaplains, but I was also hired on a nine-month part-time contract as an experiment. There was no job description, just the verbal mandate to build bridges with student life and bring the college's Christian commitment into the residence halls. 23 years later, it seems the experiment worked, or at least I hope so. Edwin Broadhead came to Berea in 1996 as the visiting Lilly Scholar and then served as director of the center for several years. He shares a, a poignant memory from his time at the CCC, and I quote, I remember the first commissioning service we held for student chaplains. The service almost did not happen. We learned mid-morning that a plane, a plane had struck one of the World Trade Towers, then the other, then we watched as the buildings collapsed. The world had changed. We thought about canceling the commissioning service, but we did not. The service began with some reflection and prayers about the ongoing crisis. Then each student chaplain was introduced and each told about their area of service. They were given a blessing through the laying on of hands and each was given a towel, a symbol of the way in which Jesus served his followers and called them to serve each other. Then we sent them to their work. This was our response in an hour of violence and hatred and in the face of the coming days of crisis. We set aside a representative group of our brightest and best to care, to listen, and to serve in the name of Jesus. On a day when so much was lost, we planted the seeds of hope and added another brick to the building of the beloved community. It was a blessing to see the unbroken, it is a blessing to see the unbroken line of students who have followed, and what a joy to see the good work they have done and will continue to do. 
Each year, when we remember the losses of 9-11, we also remember the goodness and the hope that was born that day. Jeff Poole was director through the difficult years of the economic downturn. To keep the CCC and the college alive, our jobs were divided and shared with other areas around campus. In addition to his duties as director, Jeff, was, Jeff also taught half time. Katie Basham was our coordinator of interfaith programs and also worked in Celts. Gloria Johnson taught and had her plate full providing pastoral care. And I worked with student life, served as on-call chaplain and a student chaplain supervisor and taught half time in general studies. It was a challenging time. In 2012, the college got a new president and a new director of this Tempest Christian Center. Gail, Mo Gail Bowman was the first female and the first African-American director of the center. Gail brought many new ideas as well as the chaplain's heart that drew people to her. Marcia Elliott joined us in, in 2015 and Lisette Wright and Jake Hoffmeister arrived in 2018. What a joy it is to be a part of this team which also includes our student chaplains and student office assistant. I am grateful for them and for the excellent work they do. I also deeply appreciate the supportive relationship with President Ruloff during his years as president. Thank you for that. We stand on the shoulders of many saints and we are deeply grateful for 50 years this community has trusted us to walk with you through difficult challenges, great joys, and deep times of sorrow. We are grateful for your trust, and we look forward to walking with you into the future. Happy 50th anniversary. Please join me in prayer. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. We praise and thank you for 50 years of the Willis D. Weatherford Jr. Campus Christian Center. We are joyful today that you have entrusted us with so great a calling. Lord, we pray that your love would increasingly shine through this center to our Berea College community. May we draw closer to you with each passing day. Teach us to love you with the entirety of our communal heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
Teach us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Now as we leave this place, but never your presence, fill us to overflowing with the power of your spirit. Let your grace abound and your shalom abide. In Jesus' name, amen.